So as we start this morning with this week's message, I, I want to take sort of a poll uh, of everybody and just see kind of where we are, who's who. How many of you would say you are a planner? You got to plan it out. You got to map it out. Okay. So how many of you would say, no, no, I'm a fly by the seat of my pantser? All right, a few of those. And I know we vacillate between, you know, some things we plan and some things we fly, and that, that's just fine. But maybe, you know, when it comes to, let's say, a, a vacation, how many of you are a super-duper planner? We've got every stop planned. We've got, like, time. We've got to know where we're going, what we're doing, that sort of thing. How many of you are like, let's just drive? Let's just pick, throw a dart on the map, and we, let's find out, okay, God bless you. I don't know how you do that. I don't, I don't think I, I just don't think I can do that. Maybe I could. Maybe if I didn't have two children who need to know what we're doing and when we're eating at all times, we could just, we could just go, well, what are you? I'm Benjamin Button, everybody. Welcome Benjamin today. Yeah, no. But whether you're a planner by default or whether you're a fly by the seat of your pants or by default or you fall somewhere in between, in some way, at some times, about some things, we all make plans. We all make plans. Some of us have, do this every January. They're called New Year's resolutions, right? Now, sometimes we make the resolution without the plan. That's why they fail by mid-February. So maybe if we made a plan instead of a resolution, we might succeed in some of those things we want to change. But that's an idea. That's a version of a plan. Or maybe when you got married or before you got married, you had wedding plans, you know, you had things you had to do. Now, some of y'all just, you know, let's go to the courthouse and sign a document and let's get this thing done, you know. Or some of you are like, we're just, let's get married next weekend. We'll find a guy. We'll find a place. We'll do it. That's great. So Kim and I were engaged for almost a year and a half. And so we had a long time to make plans. And they changed along the way. And we thought it was going to look like this at, at some point. And then it morphed into what it became. And it was great. But we, we made plans. So there were steps along the way and things we checked off the list and get the invitations out and, and all the other sort of things that, that some might do with even like a wedding or even growing up or kids are the same way you know you, when you're younger you have an idea of what you're going to do with your life you know one of the most famous questions that a child or a, someone older than me might get asked all the time is what do you want to be when you grow up what do you want to do with your life it's like I'm 12 I have no idea I want to go play PlayStation you know uh, right Jackson he knows he's, and he knows I'm right <laughs> I won't pick on you anymore after that I'm done with picking on Jackson now but we get that question asked all the time, or as maybe if you're, you know, a high school student, they're going to get asked all the time, where do you want to go to college? Like, I don't want to go to college. Okay, that's an option too. Okay, that's fine. But they, that's the question we ask. It's all about planning. What are you going to do? What are your goals? What are your ambitions? What is your plan? We ask that all the time. As we get older, we make financial plans and retirement plans because we want, don't want to work until the day we die, usually. Uh, now, if you love what you do, maybe you're like, yes, I do want to do that. But we typically try to make certain financial plans or retirement plans. By this age, I want, to not, I want to be doing whatever I want to do at all times. That's my retirement plan. And so we try to, along the way, see how we're doing and check in with whoever's kind of looking over those things and portfolios. And we try to make a plan for early in life, all sorts of things in life. And even at the end of life, we make plans. And I said I wasn't going to pick on Jackson, but I have this written down, so I have to do it one more time. $2 now. Oh, man, I left my wallet in my other pants. Darn it. Credit card, no, credit card yeah. <laughs> Swipe. Yeah, okay, sure. So Kennedy, gotcha. Uh, she'll do this. Now, both kids will do this, but they'll, they'll make plans with their friends mm -hmm. about like a sleepover or a play date. And then they come to me with their plan. They've already got all the details figured out, date, times, activities, other friends involved. And they're just like, hey, Dad, we want to do this. Can we do this? And I'm like, wait, wait a second. You had this planned out. You've been talking about this for a while, haven't you? You've been texting with them, haven't you? You've been planning this event for some time. So everybody, all the time, we make plans. But what happens when our plans fail? What happens when our plans don't go according to plan? That's what we'll talk about today. Because no one plans for their plan to fail. No one plans for that. I mean, we might think it's a possibility, but we, we don't usually plan for that to happen. We, we don't make a plan thinking, oh yeah, this is definitely going to flop. 
okay? We don't plan for big... So for instance, let's use the marriage analogy. You don't get married thinking you're going to get divorced, right? We don't put that in the vow. Usually we put the opposite in the vow, you know, for better or for worse, richer, poorer, sickness, health, till death. That's what we say. So we don't really have this plan in the vow, you know, oh, let's put this clause in there, pastor. You know, if I just get tired of you, this is my emergency exit and I'm going to jump off this thing. We, we don't go into marriage thinking that, but still about 40% or so of marriages do fail. Sometimes the plan fails. Sometimes the plan doesn't go to plan. You know, people don't necessarily, on their wedding day, plan to be unfaithful, but it happens in certain situations. People don't plan to marry someone who's abusive, but sometimes that happens. So sometimes the plan fails, and sometimes we fail in part of that plan, and sometimes just the plan falls out from under our feet. Sometimes our plans fail. Another example, inmates in the prison system. They probably didn't wake up when they were 15 assuming they're going to be in prison sometime. They're going to be wearing the orange jumpsuit. They probably didn't plan that. So sometimes it's just a a thing that just happens and goes crazy and out of control. One small mistake leads to other mistakes and it gets bigger and bigger and out of control and that's where they find themselves. Or sometimes you might ask someone and they just think they're entitled to do whatever they did. No matter what the law says or what I'm supposed to do or allowed to do or what society says I should, I just can decide to do whatever I wanted. And that's just where it might end them up. Sometimes even people in the prison system, it's a crime of passion. They're not thinking about the consequences. They just act. They just do whatever it is. And then finally when everything catches up to them, they're like, oh yeah, there's like a part after that that I have to now deal with. Even people, you know, homeless on the street didn't plan to be there. Sometimes it's a series of catastrophic events out of their control that puts them in a a terrible situation. Sometimes it's a series of really bad decisions that they made that maybe helped to put them in that position. Sometimes it's, you know, they were, people saw them sort of losing it or spiraling or in need, and that person just refused help. They were too self-sufficient, and so now they're in this place that may have been avoidable if only they had stopped and let go of their pride and said, okay, I'll take that assistance, I'll take that help, I'll take that hand that's reaching out. So sometimes our plans fail. We don't plan for our plans to fail, but sometimes they do. And the question is, what happens when our plans don't go to plan. So the nation of Israel kind of finds themselves in this scenario in the writings of the prophet Jeremiah. So Israel, we're talking about this series, Promises, Promises. So hundreds of years in the past, where we're going to be today, God promised a man named Abraham to make a mighty nation out of him. And we go, again, fast forward hundreds of years, and finally... Uh, Israel is their own nation, their own people with their own land, and then they have a king. And for about 120 years or so, things couldn't have been better. They're strong, they're powerful, they're growing, they're conquering, they're rich, they're powerful. They, are real, they, are, they go from nobody to somebody in this region in a matter of a few hundred years. But then the plan fails at some point in their story So the kingdom was united for about 120 years, and then in 930 B.C., Israel splits. They have basically a civil war, and they're split north and south. So the northern kingdom is still called Israel, and the southern kingdom is called Judah. And what used to be the capital city of Jerusalem is in the south. So Judah is a much smaller kingdom in terms of land mass, but they have like the capital city where the temple is. So they're kind of thinking, you know, hey, we're the better, you know, kind of kingdom here for a while. So there, Judah exists as its own kingdom for about 350 years, but the plan seems to be disintegrating before their very eyes. So during this 350-year period, there are, um, how many is that? There's 20 kings in Judah's history. Four of them are good kings. Four of them are okay kings. Twelve of them are wicked, evil, terrible kings. Now, the good news is the evil, wicked, terrible kings, all 12 of them combined are less than a third of the 350 years. Like, this guy's evil for a year, and then he dies. You're like, yay! You know, we don't want to cheer for people's death, but in this case, yes, let's do that. Or they rule for seven years, and then they're gone, and it's just back and forth, back and forth. 
But really, no matter who the king of Judah is during this 350-year period, the people are always on this seesaw with God. They'll worship him for a while, and then three generations will go by, and they forget about him. And they worship other gods, and they disobey his law. They even lose the law for quite a while. Josiah, at the, near the end of Judah's uh, history, finally they find these random scrolls hidden away in a corner. They like, they're doing their spring cleaning once every 150 years or whatever. Like, hey, we found these scrolls. They seem pretty important. And he reads them. He's like, oh, this is like the law that we should have been following all along. Maybe we should go back to that. So it'd be kind of hard to know the rules if you leave them in the corner and in and, and the dark and the dust and don't know that they even exist. But that's sort of Judah's history, back and forth, up and down. We love God kind of for a while, and then we just don't follow him at all for a long time. The plan doesn't go according to plan. And so God would send prophets to, you know, warn of judgment, as God does. If you read the Old Testament, you know, there's a lot of that. The prophets is a really thick, huge part of the Old Testament. And Jeremiah is one of these prophets. So he's sent at a really crucial time in Judah's history uh, because what he prophesies and what he actually sees about the last 15 years of his life is what he told them all along was going to happen. So Jeremiah is one of these prophets that I would call him, he's sort of the I'm warning you prophet. Like if Jeremiah were your dad, he would be telling you all the time, I will turn this car around right now. You know, that's who Jeremiah is. And, hit, and Judah, the people of Judah, are the kids in the back seat who don't listen, right? And so Jeremiah's like, God's in control of the car. If it were me, I would definitely turn the car around. God's just, but he says, God is eventually going to turn this car around. He's saying judgment will come. And Jeremiah was not a very popular guy, as you can imagine, if he's always saying, judgment is coming, judgment is coming. So he wasn't a very popular guy. They tried to kill him on more than one occasion. Uh, and they never would listen. They never would repent. The plan didn't go according to plan. So finally, in 586 B.C., this nation of Babylon comes and just destroys Judah. I mean, they, burn, they literally burn the whole nation to the ground. The mighty temple where God is worshipped, demolished, ashes, nothing left. I mean, they come through and they just ransack everything. And they take the people into what's called the exile. So Babylon basically says, hey, guess what? You were Israelites, now you're Babylonians. Welcome to the club. And they take them and try to assimilate them into being Babylonians. You're going to worship our gods, you're going to learn at our schools, you're going to do what we say, you're going to live here, and you're going to like it. And Jeremiah's like, I tried to tell you, I tried to warn you, and you wouldn't listen, and that's why the plan didn't go according to plan. That's why they didn't plan for their plan to fail, but their plan failed. So sometime early in this period of exile, when uh, the people of Judah are in Babylon, they get a letter from, guess who? Jeremiah. They get a letter from Jeremiah, and part of that letter uh, is what we have in our Bible as Jeremiah chapter 29. So think about where Judah is at this moment when they get this letter. They've been warned over and over and over again, generation after generation, repent, turn back to God, or you will be judged. And they didn't do that, and they are in the early stages of this judgment, including from this guy, Jeremiah, who then they receive a letter from. So when the people of Judah are taken into Babylon, uh, Jeremiah is actually taken to Egypt. He flees to Egypt. Uh, and so he's there, and he writes them this letter, which we have as Jeremiah 29, 11. You'll probably recognize this verse. We're going to look at one verse today. Uh, we've led all that leading up is to this one verse. Uh, and so here's what it says. This is the middle of Jeremiah's letter, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Here's what it says. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. This is one of the most famous verses in the entire Bible. If you have enough mugs, you probably have a mug with that verse on it. You probably have owned a bookmark with this verse on it. You maybe have owned a Bible cover with this verse on it. You maybe have had a bumper sticker on your car with this verse on it. This verse is an amazing promise from God. But as we've seen leading up to where this verse is found, the power of this promise is, as we saw last week, in the context of this one verse. So it's great when graduates, you know, they graduate from high school and they get a a 
graduation card with this verse on it. That's great, but that's not really what he's talking about here, as we've already seen. The people who are getting this letter are in the middle of, like, destruction to them. Like, their homes are destroyed, their temples destroyed, their prisoners in a foreign land. They don't speak the language, they don't know the culture, they don't serve the God, and they're being forced to change their way of life, and this could have been prevented if, if they had just turned, as, they, as, as Jeremiah had said, their plan didn't go according to plan, but God says, oh, but I have a plan. That's the power of this verse. It's not just a cute little saying that we put on, and it's fine if you have a mug. I'm not saying, you know, go home and throw your mugs away or rip up your Bible cup. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's more than just a cute little phrase that we make this one verse to be. It's a powerful promise. It's powerful. Because what the promise really is saying here from Jeremiah in this letter, he says, you will suffer, but not forever. And he says, you will be and are being punished, but you will not ultimately be replaced. That's what this verse is saying to this people who feel abandoned by God. Many, some of them may feel that way. They feel God has let them down when he's like, no, it's turn that around and then we got it right. They, they feel hopeless. They feel afraid. They, they feel like there is no future. No, no. What do you mean there's a future, Jeremiah? I don't care what God, what God told you to tell me. There's no future. Have you seen, have you heard about what Judah looks like? There's nothing left. There's no future. There's no hope. The plan is over. We messed up the plan beyond all recognition, beyond any repair. And Abra, er, Ab, I keep saying Abraham. Jeremiah says, no, no. That's what you think the plan is. But I'm telling you, God has a plan, and he knows what that plan is, and it still is available. That's the power of this verse. One key to this verse, though, is the verse before, and the question is how long? He, God says through Jeremiah, you will suffer, you are suffering, you will continue to suffer. Well, how long? Well, in verse 10, he's already told them this, and he warned them this years before, and they wouldn't listen, but here, let's read this, Jeremiah 29, verse 10. This is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. So just like we already said, Jeremiah was the I'm warning you prophet. I'll turn this car around prophet. He was also the I told you so prophet. Like we said at the beginning, Abraham, what in the world is up with me? Jeremiah, 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 Jeremiah. Okay, Jeremiah has, is living in an interesting place in history because he's lived long enough to prophesy about this event that he sees happen And then he sees it happen and lives another 15, 16 years to see the beginning of what he prophesied. So he cannot just, like some prophets who prophesied way before, never see this happen. They they live and die never knowing what this prophecy will eventually look like. Jeremiah says the prophecy and then sees it and gets to see it lived out for quite some time. To see, okay, wow, God wasn't kidding. (laughs) God wasn't messing around. He wasn't joking. He meant what he said. Like, they, he, they destroyed everything. Judah is gone. It's a crater in the earth. So he's kind of the I told you so prophet. But when it comes to 70 years, he'd already told them this years before. So Jeremiah 29 is in an interesting spot. The two chapters before are part of this prophecy of destruction from years before. Jeremiah is weird. Some of the prophets are weird in the way that they're placed in our Bible. Because the, like this event happened eight years ago, and then the very next chapter is like 10 years after that happened. And then the next, but the next chapter is in the past too. So it's hard to sometimes see how the timeline works. But Jeremiah 27 and 28 are two really interesting chapters. So Jeremiah 27, he's already prophesied, you will face judgment for 70 years from Babylon. He's already made it very clear, okay? But there's uh, another prophet, Hanani, and he is a false prophet. And he's saying, oh, no, 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 no. God told me you only suffer for two years. So don't listen to this downer. Don't listen to this guy. He's, you know, half glass, half empty with Jeremiah. I'm telling you, yeah, you'll suffer, but just two years, God will free you. It'll be fine. It'll hurt. It'll sting, but it, it, just two years. And Jeremiah's like, don't listen to this clown. He's a joker. He's an imposter, and he's going to die because he's a false prophet. It's like, wait, what was that last part? Yes, yeah, I, yeah you heard me right. Jeremiah says, this false prophet is going to die. God is going to judge him with his death. Two months later, Guess what? False prophet's dead. 
And so in, in Jeremiah 27, he, uh, that was Jeremiah 28. In Jeremiah 27, there are people who are saying, oh, they're not, you're not going to suffer at all. Other false prophets, oh, it's not going to be a problem, not going to be a big deal. And God tells Jeremiah to wear an a ox yoke around his neck and walk around with it and carry it around for some undetermined period of time. He's like, this is your symbol that this is the future that Judah will face. They will face judgment. They will face disaster. Wear this heavy yoke on you because that will represent the Babylonians overtaking and being a heavy yoke on my people for their disobedience. So you have all of this in these first two chapters. They, you will suffer. It'll be for 70 years. It, put it in the bank. And then chapter 29 starts this with chapter 30 and 31 about, yes, you will suffer. Yes, it will be painful. Yes, it will be terrible. It will seem like all hope is lost, but there is restoration in the future for you. So it's right in the middle of this really five-chapter larger story about what this whole thing will look like. And the real key to this promise in uh, these verses are this, this is the, the key that just really just jumped out to me this week, is that what God is saying in Jeremiah 29 is, he says, I know the plan. It's the same plan from the very beginning. It is the plan. Let's look at verses 10 and 11 real quick and look at some of these key words here. So, Jeremiah 29, verse 10, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Notice God says this is not another plan. This is not a secondary plan plan. This is not a new plan. This is not an updated and revised version 2.0 of the plan. This is the plan. This is not plan B or C or D. This is plan A. There's only one plan, and it's still the plan. It kind of reminds me of uh, Lego, building Legos. Now, I know when a certain small child that I live with who will remain nameless, (laughs) for some reason, there's just so much material here, even three, four years ago, he, there would be these kits that would, the booklet is this thick. I mean, it's like 200 pages of 500 steps to build this huge, massive thing of Legos. And so a couple of things, maybe I'm not going to say the adult that lives with that child in the home, this would happen to them at times, where you would be like on step 138, and you would try to fit two things together, and you realize, oh, that piece from step 105 is in the wrong spot. Oh, things didn't go according to plan. So what you have to do is go back 33 steps, undo what you just spent 30 minutes doing to get back to put that piece over right there. It's got to be there. It can't be there. It won't fit. It's got to be here. So you got to take it apart, and then it's, it's frustrating uh, it kind of, you know, bruises one's ego, you know, as an adult who knows how to read and follow instructions sometimes, right? Uh, but you have to do that. It makes the process longer, obviously. I have to undo what I did to get to where I need to go. Yes, but if you stick to the original plan, you will get what's on the front of the box. That's what's happening here, right? Right? Yes, it took 70 years of pain and suffering and death and misery and fear and doubt and uncertainty, but God's saying it's still the same plan. My plan is the same plan from the very beginning. Yes, you've sort of gone on a really long route to get there, and you've caused unnecessary frustration and pain and loss to get there, but I still have the same plan. Or with the Legos, you know, sometimes you get nearly finished and you set it on the table and maybe you bump the table when you get up with your hip or your dog comes by and sweeps, you know, the leg or whatever and then you just, and then you just kind of stand there and look and you're like, this did not go according to plan, obviously, you know. I'm looking at the box. This is not what's on the box, you know, obviously, And so you have to find out how much you can salvage and where you have to start back from and rebuild it. However, in the same way, if you get to that spot 
where things went wrong and build from there, you will eventually get to what's on the box. That's what Judah's facing here in Jeremiah 29. Eventually, you'll get there. The former prime minister of Great Britain, Winston Churchill, he once said this. He said, success is not final and failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. That's also what Judah's facing. They thought, success, we made it. We're a kingdom with a king. We can do whatever we want. We can live however we want, and that's final. And God's saying, no, 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 that's not success, first of all, and it's not final. There's still a law, the law that you still have to obey. I'm still your God that you worship. There's still a way this is supposed to function. That was the first part. But then when they're in the middle of failure in Babylon, suffering in anguish and uncertainty and fear of the future, they think, oh, man, you know, failure's fatal. We're done. God's through with us. He's going to throw us out. It's, we've gone too far. And he's like, no, 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 no. It's the courage to continue that counts. And so here's, here's how we see that. Here's really we'll get to then some of the benefits for them, and then we'll close with some of the benefits of this promise for us this morning too. So we read verses 10 and 11. The next three verses kind of give some of these benefits of this promise from God to his people who are in a desperate situation. They're in dire straits. They are in a place of hopelessness. But here's what he says. Verse 12, Then you will call on me, and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Verse 13 is my favorite verse in the whole Bible right here. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. So the first really payoff or benefit of the promise is that God says, hey, if you seek me, you'll still find me. I haven't forgotten about you. It maybe feels like it. From your vantage point, it maybe, it maybe looks like it. You may even be angry with me, but I'm saying, no, no. When this time comes, you will come to a point where you will turn back to me and pray to me, and I'll hear you. I'll listen to you. You'll seek me, and I won't be hiding off somewhere where I can't be found. I want to be found. That's what God says. I want to be found. And I will be found as you return to me. You see, the reason that Judas' plan went off the rails is because they stopped seeking God. That's the whole problem. That's the whole point of their dilemma in this part of their history is they stopped seeking God. And so this return that we're looking at is not just a physical return. It's also a spiritual return. So he's saying, yes, I will restore you. you. You'll rebuild Judah. You'll rebuild the temple. You'll rebuild your homes and the city and everything around it. And we see that a few hundred years later near the end of the New Old Testament. But it's not simply a physical return. It's a spiritual renewal. That's what God is most concerned about when it came to Judah. Let's go back to verse 11 then for some of the other main uh, keys to this promise or main uh, benefits of this promise. There's three words in in verse 11, we'll look at here for just a minute, that are the key to this promise from God, for Judah specifically here. So again, he says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. First he says, plans to prosper you. So the Hebrew word that's used there is this word shalom. Probably pretty familiar with that word. It's peace. It's ultimate mutual human flourishing. This is part of God's promise of restoration. This plan involves prospering Judah. Again, remember, it's hard for us to see so far. We know how the story ends. We know they eventually get out of, and, of their situation, rebuild, and things change and progress. And it's a cool Bible story, but like they're in the thick of it. Like, they're in the middle of this desperate, dark situation in a foreign land where they don't know anyone or anything at all. And they're like, what is going on? And God promises to prosper. He promises shalom, peace, flourishing. What, what, is, what is that? Where is that? Well, God promises that to them in this verse. Then he says, to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope. Hope is simply the belief that things will get better. And it seems like a very simple thing, but hope is a profoundly powerful thing. So there was a story of a a large school district in a major city several years ago, and they had this program I don't know if they still do, but they did at the time, where 
uh, if students were going in that school district, in that city, were going to be in the hospital for a prolonged period of time, they would have tutors who would come and tutor them during the week in the hospital if they were able to. So there's a story of one of the tutors that went to a, a, a elementary school age boy who had been severely burned. And she wasn't quite sure when she walked in the situation. She knew, I'm going to teach him grammar. That's what they're learning right now. That's what I'm going to teach him. But she really didn't know his physical condition. And so she walks in and she sees him and she's like, how, how is this going to, how am I going to be able just to teach him grammar? I can't, I mean, I feel so, my heart just goes out to him. But he was somewhat responsive. He was quiet and, you know, not really in the mood, obviously, but he kind of went with it and she was there and they went through a grammar lesson and then she left and she just bawled her eyes out and she's just like, this is not going to work. This is torture for this child. What am I doing? But she went back the next day for the next lesson and before she walked into the boy's room, one of the nurses came and said, what did you do yesterday? And she said, oh, we did a grammar lesson. You know, that's what I'm paid to do. She's like, no, no, what did you do? Like, like you left and overnight he had like some sort of miraculous like, he started, you know, responding to the treatment. Like, his whole situation is, like, gone through the, like, changed in a crazy way. Like, what did you, she's like, I just taught him a grammar lesson, right? And so they kind of do this for a couple weeks, and then a couple weeks go by, and his condition just miraculously improves. So they finally ask him uh, a couple weeks after that, what, what happened? Like, what was it that, you know, kind of changed everything? And here's what this kid said. He said, well, I didn't figure they would bring a tutor to teach me grammar if I'm going to die. All he needed was a little bit of hope. A crazy grammar lesson from a tutor at school was enough hope to make him fight for his life. To even cause, like, not even things that he knew, to his body just to react in a different way. To respond to treatment that otherwise he may not have or may have taken way longer. Hope is a powerful thing. Yeah, it's just simply thinking things will get better, but that can be a game changer. It can be a life changer. And so God promises as part of this plan, hope, which is what they desperately need in this moment is hope. And the third thing that he says in this verse is he's going to prosper them, and his plan is to give them hope and a future. Now, this is maybe the biggest one, because again, there's no future back there. There's just, there is no, we're, we're going to maybe be stuck here forever. Maybe it's 70 years times infinity we're going to be here. Maybe Judah's never going to exist again. Maybe God's people will never have their land again ever. But he says, no, there's a future. So God promises to restore what they lost. They lost it. It's on them. It's their fault. They had warning. They had opportunity. They did not respond. But he says, I'm going to restore that to you anyway. It's part of your future. I'm going to fix what you broke. That's the power of this promise in Jeremiah 29, 11. What you destroyed, I in my grace, through my will, will fix it. I'll put the pieces back together. So that's the power of this promise for Judah. It's about peace and prosperity for them. It's about hope in the midst of despair. And it's about a certain future that awaits them because God promised it to them. And as we've already established in week one of this series, God always keeps his promises. So what does this mean for us, though? This specific promise in this specific context doesn't mean anything to us, right? Like, I don't live in Babylon. I don't, I'm not facing their issues. I'm not facing their certainty. So this specific promise may not, may not fit our situation, but the principle of the promise does apply to us thousands of years later in a different context, on a different continent, in a different type of world and situation altogether. The application is still the same. So here's my encouragement. We'll run through these same things again, these same four things. First, if, you're, if the plan that you're following has gone from God's plan to your plan, seek him, right? That's the whole problem with Judah. They thought this plan is, is really about us, and we're going to figure it out, and we're going to make it happen. And guess what? It ran off the rails quickly and awfully and terribly for a long time. Generations lived and died in Babylon, never seeing Judah that their ancestors always talked about. So if, you're, if the plan that you're involved in is now your plan, no, 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 seek, seek God. Because what he says, if you seek me, you'll find me. And if we don't seek him, we'll find what we don't want to find. Sometimes that even means there are factors that are out of your control. But maybe instead of seeking God when those things happen, we just get inward focused 
and we cry about it, and we complain about it, and we worry about it, that's not going to work either. Like, no, no, maybe you didn't cause the plan right now not to work. It's maybe not your fault directly, but just going insular with it is not going to help solve the problem, is it? We want to seek God even in that context, even in that way, especially in that way. Because in that way, he will encourage you. He'll direct you through whatever someone did to you or said to you or caused to happen or whatever, maybe other things outside of your control caused the plan to crumble and fall. If we seek God, he will show us a way through that. And then just like he said to Judah, part of God's plan for you is to give you peace. It's to give you peace no matter the storm you may be going through, no matter the uncertainty you may be facing, no matter the fear of the unknown that's in front of you or all the decisions that need to be made and you don't feel like you have the capacity and I don't feel peace, God promises to be your peace, your shalom. He promises to be more than enough for whatever it is that you are facing. His plan and his promise for you is peace. God's plan and promise for you is hope. Know this, God is in control. Again, hope is such a small thing, right? That's a really silly, small statement. God's in control. Okay, he's got the hold in his hand. He does, right? He is in control. So as small and simple as that may sound, this hope that he offers to us is everything. It's everything. He sees you right where you are. Whether you made the mess or not, he sees you. Whether you're a victim or not, he sees you. It doesn't matter what it is or how long it's been or if you're to blame or not, he sees where you are. If you haven't seen progress in the plan, keep hoping. Don't quit. Don't quit on God. He's working the plan. He's working the plan. That leads to the last thing. God's plan and God's promise is for a certain future. I'm going to give you hope and a future. So here's another simple but profound thing. God's plans don't fail. Remember, go back to the verse. The plans I have for you, not a different plan that I have made up now. Not a backup plan that I had just in case, because I thought this would probably, I thought you'd probably screw it up, right? I thought, I'm pretty sure you would. No, no, it's the plan. So God's plans don't fail. Why? Because God's plans can't fail. So let me say something that you initially might be offensive, but it'll, it'll take a load off. You're not strong enough to ruin God's plan, okay? You're not powerful enough to ruin God's plan. You're not big and bad enough to mess up God's plan. So take that weight off your shoulder. Stop thinking that you've gotten so far that God can't fix it or you've broken it to so many small pieces God can't put it back together. Nope. God's plans don't fail because they can't fail no matter what. God's plan never fails. So this is for all of us. This promise, and what it comes down to this week, the promise is his plan. That's the promise. That's a simple thing, again, but it's profound. It's life-changing. God's promise is his plan. He's got plans for each of you. And it's the same plan he always had, no matter where you are in the you know, projection, no matter where you are on the journey, no matter how. I thought I'd be over here by now. God still has a plan. It's the same plan. So as we seek him, we will find that peace we will find that hope. We will find eventually that certain future that awaits us because God's plans don't and can't fail. So let's hold on to this peace-filled, hope-filled, hope for the future that is God's plan and claim this promise from him today.